Hello and welcome to Unprofessional Engineering. My name is James. And you got Luke. Luke, we're back with part two of the one hit wonder engineers. I think it's Twa. Is... Oh, well, depending on your engineers, maybe that is the yeah, case. Twa. If you haven't already, people, go check out episode number one, where Luke and I talk about some amazing engineers who came up with a whopping one invention, and that's all they ever did in their life. Yeah, so in my case, in some cases, they do other things, but they're only known for one thing. So I I need to clarify that a little bit, because mine did only really known for one. Well, that really changes things up for me. No, no, no. I think it's okay. It's, you know... You'll see what I mean whenever I get to my peoples. I want to see what you mean. Could you go ahead and start with your first great one-hit wonder inventor? Okay, so let me start out with, and tell me if you can guess who it is, because we're going to play this guessing game, apparently. We are. We are. I love this. So on October 19th, 1982, this automaker was arrested and charged with conspiracy to obtain and distribute 55 pounds of cocaine. He was acquitted in August 1984. I know who this is. Okay. I was going to have you like tell us the name and tell us some info about them and then see if we could guess their invention. But this is Mr. DeLorean. None other than John DeLorean. Uh, But that dude wishes he could go back in time. (laughs) No joke. That was good. Uh, See what you you. did there? Uh, Uh, So, of course, this is the DeLorean. This is the DMC from Back to the Future. Um, Probably one of the most iconic cars ever. Oh, probably. Never really a car that you could actually buy. I mean, they they were sold. There was a handful of them sold, but- Did you say uh, 55 kilos? 50, 55 pounds of cocaine. Oh, that's it. Okay, that's uh, nice. And this was, and this wasn't like when he was like, who measures it in pounds? I don't know. Anyways, so apparently he was trying to make money to keep the company afloat. So this, this wasn't like after no, the company wait, failed. Uh-uh. This, this you is like wow, drugs his business. to keep the business afloat. I mean, he's trying, right? I mean, that is fantastic. James, to keep unprofessional engineering afloat, you don't think you would do a couple unsightly kind of things to keep us going? I can't spend the money we make fast enough. So, I mean, I can't even imagine that being a problem. So, so, so John DeLorean, <laughs> let's let's move on, was born uh, January 6, 1925 in our very own Detroit, Michigan. So no wonder Ooh, he had yeah. an obsession with cars. Uh, he actually died March 19th, 2005. And all that, all, not all that long ago. I actually remember that being in the news being a thing. Uh, there was really? actually a documentary slash movie that they made about DeLorean recently. Um so uh, he went to the Lawrence Institute of Technology. Uh, World War II interrupted his uh, studies. And in 1943, uh, he was drafted into the army. He served about three years. He ended up finishing his undergraduate degree uh, in 1948. Uh, this is a pretty educated person. Uh, in 1952, he graduated from the Chrysler Institute with a master's degree in automotive engineering. He joined the Chrysler's engineering team. He also went back and got his MBA at Michigan's Ross School of Business in 1957. So super educated. Uh, So his primary invention, so my one hit wonder was the DeLorean, the DMC. I pieced Uh, that one together. uh, And the the car, if you don't know the car, hopefully you know the car, but if you don't know the car, this thing was made out of stainless steel. It had the gull wing doors that would open up. It had a Renault engine in it that was super underpowered. This thing was super heavy. It didn't handle well. And here's (laughs) the crazy part about this whole story. He had people like Johnny Carson and Sammy One-Eyed Davis Jr., backing him financially when he started the company like he got millions of dollars from like all of these celebrities uh to start the delorean motor company in 1978 um but here's the other things he did that were actually way better but he's not really known for he's credited with designing the gto and the firebird back in the 70s for for general motors which is crazy two of my favorite cars huh i did not know that but he's exactly so one hit wonder the DeLorean. I love it. That was well done, Luke. My first inventor is Mr. John Walker. First clue, not to be confused with Johnny Walker. Johnny Walker, the drink. Not, okay. not, not to be confused with that. Born in, this is funny, Stockton on Tees, 
County Durham in 1781. Where is that? Went, New Jersey? That, J- Jersey, yeah. Okay. Or, or the UK. Okay. Um, I looked. It, it looks like it's in England. It's pretty close to Scotland, though, it seemed. That okay. was what I, I mean, I'm not real good at American ge- geography, so over there is even worse. <laughs> Anyways, he went to the local grammar, grammar school, and um, he was an apprentice to some guy named Watson Alcock the principal surgeon of the town surgeon okay okay he had however an aversion to surgical operations so he left the profession and turned to chemistry instead so any guesses off of off of that information a chemist basically general anesthesia no (sighs) fun fun fact for you though luke uh your favorite podcast host me in the fifth grade was looking at hamburger under the microscope and I got all grossed out by it. And my teacher was like, yeah, so you don't have a future in medicine. So good luck with that. Um, he developed an interest to find a means of obtaining fire easily. And I think it's safe to say we've all had that part of our life. Mm-hmm. Any guesses from this? Fire? Easily obtaining fire. He, he invented the match. He invented the easy strike match. That is correct, Lou. Really? Well done. Yes, nice. I'm impressed. So several chemical mixtures were already known, which would ignite by kind of like a sudden explosion, but it had not been found how they could like transmit the flame to a slow burning substance like wood or cardboard or something like that and do so safely without them just blowing up on you, right? Uh, So Walker was preparing to light a mixture one occasion, a match that had been dipped into um, fire by accident or had, had caught fire by accident because of friction striking on a hearth. And the dude was like, whoa, this is kind of a big deal if I can replicate this. Heck yeah. And this is how matches were born. So they consisted of wooden splints and sticks and cardboard and sulfur and some potash and gum and other good stuff. The price of a box of 50 matches was one shilling. And fun fact for all of you who don't know what a shilling is like me, one shilling was a coin worth one twentieth of a pound sterling or oh, 12 pence. Yeah. So still doesn't mean anything to me, but it, it sounds pretty cheap, right? Um, so little, fun, fun fact for you, do you mm-hmm. know that f- even today, however many years later, the instrument of choice for survival in like hiking situations is a match because it's because it, a fireproof match, like it, it's there's there's no chance it's not going to work, but like a Zippo might not work or like a lighter or a striker might work, but, but an actual emergency match. I actually have a pack for whenever I do like my cold weather camping. Very good. And then when you get lost, you can make a fire and send smoke signals to mm-hmm. so get rescued. I would come rescue you, Luke. Uh, two and a half years after Walker invented this thing, uh, some other dude showed up and had the same idea independent of him doing the same kind of thing. Um, they had all of these documents though, showing that Walker was the one who had already made sales of this and that he came up with it first. So no problems there. But what's interesting is that he was already well off. Like he had already made some cash money doing other stuff. He refused to patent his invention despite being encouraged by other folks, such as Michael Faraday, who we all should know and love. And I yeah. think we might've talked about in other episodes. Quite a few times. So he got no fame or fortune from this invention. And that's all yeah, I have to say about benefits, Johnny Walker. It kind of benefits the world, right? I mean, did you just think what, what would happen if we did, if we had like carry around like different chemicals and like hopefully they don't blow up around us. That is still how I start huh? fires. In fact, <laughs> I find it more exciting. <laughs> Before we go on with your next great one hit wonder inventor, I think it's time for us to take a break for a word from our sponsor. So the DeLorean Motor Company. With all of their cash money, they are not sponsoring no. us mm. and their Q-Cane. Um, We do have some shout outs, though. Calum B. My name is Calum. I think I'm saying it right. I'm sure I'm you a are. 27, I'm 27 year old, years old, and I'm a mechanical engineering student from Scotland, study, studying at Harriot Watt University. Um, completing an honors degree, fancy pants, through my work who manufacture parts for warships and submarines for various navies around the world. So that's pretty cool. Uh, The way you guys explain stuff relating to engineering is easy to understand and to follow. Just wanted to say, awesome podcast. Oh, and look at this. He says, can you do an episode on the Concorde? 
which is what we just recorded before this one. I knew there was a connection somewhere. I really so, botched this. I, you totally botched this. But so the one and only impression that I do on like a regular basis is a Sean Connery. You ready for it? And since we oh, got the goodness. Scottish right in. Yeah, let's hear this it. This is Saturday Night Live. It's one of my favorites. It's not actually Sean Connery. It's the guy playing Jeopardy. And it's, if it's not Scottish, it's crap. <laughs> That's that my, wasn't terrible. That well, wasn't terrible. That was, that was my Scottish impression for our Scottish folks. Can you choose the pen is mightier as the category in Jeopardy? <laughs> that no? <is> hilarious. <laughs> our next write-in was from Ke- was from Kevin G. I'm a huge fan from Miami, Florida. I'm nice. another one, mechanical engineer who graduated go, from K-Dog. Florida International University. I think they might have been the ones who beat the player with their helmet in football a few years ago. Ah. Anyways, they get a stainless steel ring, which they're supposed to wear on their pinky finger uh, for our work of our working hand as kind of like that uh, Canadian thing. I can't remember what it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They also got a ring. Uh, We had a whole ceremony and all order of the engineer is what it was called. I thought that this was something all engineering schools did. Might be a great topic for a future episode. I don't know about you, but I feel like Penn State needs to up their game. I was either so bad that they were like, we're not giving this dude an engineering ring, or they just don't do this stuff. So I love it. I love these secret societies. Did we do a secret society episode? No. Did you you do one earlier? You you poo-pooed me on that one. I think if we did like engineering secret societies, we could be okay. That's what I think we're going to do. We have to check it out. I'm putting that on the list. So if any of you have any secret societies in engineering that you want to tell us about, uh, maybe maybe we could make our own secret society. Um, Anywho, anything like that, you want stickers, you want a shout out, you want an episode, all that good stuff, email me at unprofessionalengineering at gmail.com. And as usual, we love the reviews. Make sure you listen, subscribe, share. And as always, you can tell your smart devices to play the Unprofessional Engineering Podcast. Excellent. Luke, who is your next inventor? Since you kind of know mine, I didn't know we were going to do this game. Uh, I just came up with it. So I think I'm pronouncing this correctly. Uh, Her name is uh, Melita Bentz. So, and this is perhaps the most significant inventor that I've ever like looked into. <laughs> I and, think so. And you're going to understand why here in a second. Uh, so she was born January 31st, 1873 in, uh, Dresden, Germany. She died, uh, in 1950, uh, also, uh, in Germany. She had a spouse, Hugo, uh, and a couple of kids. And the reason why <laughs> she was the most, I think, significant engineer ever is she essentially invented the coffee filter. So obviously this is apparent, you know, uh, who else had, would come up with this? Exactly. We, we had this discussion last week on a podcast about like coffee is what fuels engineers. Every, co- every engineer has a coffee cup on their desk or something like that. And they're just, that's how they see exactly. Um, so, and here's how it started. So every morning she would uh, go to her kitchen and make coffee like people always do. Well, back in the day, apparently the way they made coffee, they would just take like boiling water and throw in grinds. And then you would just, you would just drink coffee with grinds in it. And then you had to clean the cup out and clean the, the, the teapot out. And it was like a super like disastrous thing to do. Like, could you imagine how messy that is? Like if you had to do that, you'd probably quit drinking coffee. I would um, not. So what she did was she took a piece of blotting paper, which I have no idea what blotting paper is. I probably should have looked into that. Um, but essentially a piece of paper, she punched a couple holes in it and she essentially made a pour over coffee contraption there was a a little uh lid that had some holes on it and then the paper had uh, some holes in it and she poured the coffee in there and did a pour over and over years and years of testing she finally got the filter to work the way current modern day uh coffee filters work um she tested her new invention uh on her friends and family uh having coffee in the afternoons um it says her her son apparently gave an interview about this and here's the crazy part she got uh a patent on june in 1908 from the imperial patent office in berlin and her and her husband started a business out of their home and today and i i've seen the logo now that i say it 
Today, Maletta Group employs 5,800 employees across Holy the moly. world. The company reported revenue of 1.7 billion euros, and um, they own all, and they're all in the coffee world. And you've seen the little biscuits, and they mm. say M, you know, M E L I T T A. So they're huge in the coffee world because of this very original invention of the coffee filter from Maletta Benz. Very good. That is an important invention. Oh my I goodness. do like the grounds. Sometimes I take them like a dip and just put them in my lip and mm, get a little extra energy. What's wrong with you? I don't, I don't do that. Yeah. No, that's awesome. I'm shocked that it's such a big company still. That's very cool. Um, okay. Moving on to my next one. So my next one was going to be Samuel Morris, you know, Morris code. Beep, beep, boop, boop, bop, oh, beep. I would have never that guessed. Guy. Okay. Yeah, but apparently- beep, boop, boop. Beep, boop, boop, bop. Oh, there you um, go. There you go. So I always thought it was Morris code, not Morse code. So I was wrong there. Not going to cover this one because he did other things. Super established painter, did a bunch with okay. uh, telegraphs, but also found out he was very anti-Catholic and very pro-slavery. So I didn't want to give him too many shout outs here. Gotcha. But my next one is L Laszlo Bureau. Any guesses? He, may he invented the Bureau. Like the cupboards that you put clothes in. No. Uh, okay. Born on September 29th, 1899. Died. Good run here. October 24th of 1985. Oh, wow. Wasn't the 24th when the Concorde made its last flight? I think, I think so. so. Yeah. Anywho, uh, born in Budapest, which was part of the Austro-Hungarian -Hung Empire. Okay. Um, like all great inventors, he quit school and became a journalist. Any guesses yet? Hmm. The ballpoint pen. Oh my Seriously? goodness, did I get it? How did you know this? I, that, I totally did not see this dude. I swear. You said journalist and inventor, so I just assumed writing. That's what I thought Is might that right? it together. Yes, Luke. <laughs> I am a genius. I am blown away that you got this. Oh my goodness. So while, oh my goodness, <laughs> while working as a journalist, he noticed that the ink used in newspapers uh, for printing newspapers dried super fast, right? Leaving the dry, the paper dry, you couldn't smudge it, all good stuff. He tried the same ink that they used that in a fountain pen, but found that it wouldn't flow through the tip because it was too viscous. So I was going to ask you again at this point, what guess you might have, but you already got it because you're a genius, genius apparently. So he presented the first production of the ballpoint pen at the Budapest International Fair in 1931. Do you pronounce it Budapest or Budapest? I Budapest, I think is. I do too, but I think we're wrong. Okay. Um, <laughs> working with his brother, Georgie, G-Y-O with some dots, R-G-Y, gotcha. uh, a chemist, he developed a new tip consisting of a ball that was free to turn in a socket. And as it turns out, Luke, it would pick up ink as the ball would on the back around. side. Yep. yep. And on the back side, that's right. And then it would then slap it on the paper as you're writing. Uh, patented the invention in Paris in 1938. During World War II, he ran away from the Nazis, which seems like a good idea, along with his brother, and moved to Argentina in 1943. So in June of 43, they filed another patent in the United States and formed Bureau Pens of Argentina. Fun fact for you, in Argentina, the ballpoint pen is known as the Bureau Me, like the B-I-R-O-M-E, so like after him. Another fun fact, Inventor's Day in Argentina is celebrated on his birthday, the 29th of September. So that's cool. Did he work uh, for Bic in some? Because you know, I, I thought Bic Why is, do you ruin no everything I have to say? <laughs> everything I have, you're just like, let me ruin that, James. In 1945, Marcel, I don't know how you say it, Bick, I suppose, B-I-C-H, bought the patent from this dude for his pen, which soon became the main product of his Bick company. Bick has sold more than 100 billion, with a B, ballpoint pens worldwide. I read somewhere back, it was years ago about the Bic pen is like the most mass produced consumer product like in the world by like a huge margin. Like there's no other like day to day thing that people use that is that's been produced more than the Bic pen. Yeah, 
I didn't yeah. mean to ruin that for you. Sorry. I feel like this game really backfired on me. Not only <laughs> did you get it before I thought you would, but then you steal the big thing on top of it. Sorry, Gosh. sorry. I'm tired of all this, so let's take a break for this week's Luke's Rant. So here's my rant. This one happened last evening, James. Ooh, so close to home. It is close to home. So it's getting cold. We're recording this uh, middle December, roughly. It's cold. And it's getting cold. And it wasn't super cold last night, but it was cold enough to be like agitating. And at about one o'clock in the morning, I hear a dog like barking and crying. And I'm like, okay, someone let your dog out. They'll let him back in the door. Because was it your dog? <laughs> no, no, no. My dog is sleeping under the covers with my daughter. Uh, <laughs> it, she doesn't come out from under the covers until about 9 a.m. Um, so I'm thinking, oh, they let the dog out. The dog's barking. They'll open the door and let the dog back in. About 45 minutes passes. This dog is like crying and barking. Oh, and I'm wow. like, and and there's an ordinance in where I live uh, in Crafton that if you leave a dog outside unattended and it barks for more than 30 minutes, it's considered a noise violation and you can actually call uh, the police and they'll show up. And then there's also a temperature thing. If it's below a certain temperature, essentially you're a jerk for putting your dog outside. For oh, that well, that's absolutely true. Yes. So I, so don't be that person. So I don't know if this person who lives behind me is listening to our podcast. I highly doubt it because you're a jerk, but do not leave your dogs outside in cold weather. Don't let your dogs bark all night when they're trying to come back in because you don't want to deal with them for whatever reason. I mean, you're literally a jerk if you do that. Like, why have an animal if you're going to do that to the animal? Like, if, if you have a dog, take care of it. Don't. That's terrible. Makes me mad just thinking about it. It wasn't. If it was really cold last night, I probably would have went and knocked on their door. But it was like 45 degrees last night. It wasn't super cold, so. Yeah, that is that is a good shout out, Luke. That is terrible. You responsible pet owner. And make sure you support ASPCA or your local animal shelters, because I always like to give animal shelters and rescue organizations a shout out. Do you do Amazon Smile? You can make uh, that uh, your who you donate to. Yep. Yeah, I think mine's Westmoreland Counties, but I can't recall. Um, very good, Luke. Well done. Now, on to your final inventor. My final one is, I'm so bad with pronunciation and name. No, you're I'm, not. I'm just going to go it for time. it. This is G-U-I-D-O. So, and it's a that hard- was not, You didn't even try to pronounce it. You so, like so spelled half of it. How do you say a hard G? G? G. G. So his name is Guido Van Rossum. See, that um, was so good. So this cat's actually it's still not, alive. It's not Guido? No. I, I, no? I'm serious. I, it could be Guido. It's a, it said it's a hard G. I had a G friend that liked that. Okay. With anyway. the pronunciation. Uh, so this cat's actually still alive. I think this is one of the only ones that might still be alive. Oh, wow. So he was yeah. born uh, January 31st, 1956. So that puts him somewhere around 65 years of age. He was born in uh, Harlem, Netherlands. So he's, what are they in Netherlands? Neanderthals? <laughs> Dutch? I don't know. No, I don't. Okay. Anyways, I forget what they're called. So, uh, so here's a quote from him. Uh, in, and I want to see if you can guess what he did. Cause you definitely don't know this guy and don't look it up. Uh, and here's a quote. Invariably you'll find that if the language is any good, your users are going to take it and place it where uh, take it to places where you never thought it would be taken. I wasn't listening. I'm sorry. Invari time. invariably you will find that if the language is any good your users are going to take it to places you never thought it would be taken so he came up with like like a translation book no this no. is okay. the cat that developed python i only get one chance yeah because yeah i only needed one that's true. Uh, so he is the developer. Oh, he came up with Python lang coding language. There you go. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> uh, so he developed uh, the Python coding language, um, and he's considered the uh, the creator of it. And he graduated from uh, the University of Amster Amsterdam uh, in 1982 with a master's degree in mathematics and computer science. Um, he spent his life as a programmer. He worked in the United States for NIST. Uh, CNRI, Google, Dropbox, and he retired from a while for Dropbox, and he just joined Microsoft last year in 2020. Apparently, he um, doesn't 
you know, think uh, he's done doing his work with Python. Um, and here's an interesting fun fact. Uh, since Python is considered an open source uh, tool, that's why he has uh, to keep working. <laughs> Van Rossen has accepted the title of Benevolent Dictator for Life, BDFL. I've seen this in other places and I didn't know what that meant, but apparently BDFL is Benevolent Dictator for Life. Uh, for the huh. Python user community, because it's because it's mediated, he's the one that whenever disputes come up amongst users of an open source, he's the one that actually mediates those disputes and makes sure that the programming language is taken care of for like future reasons. So yeah, that's ben interesting. Benevolent dictator uh, for life. Am, am I the benevolent dictator for unprofessional engineering? You are. Uh, Python was released in 1991. So I was a sophomore in high school when that was released and you were pooping in your pants is my guess. I just got over that this week. So <laughs> thank you for that. <laughs> I was nine. I don't think you still poop in your pants. <laughs> Is that all your information? Then? That's all I got. <laughs> all right. And my last one, and this is the inventor who started all of this, Mr. Nikola Otto. Engine. Well done. So the story went like this. Luke said, we should cover this guy. And I was like, sweet, good idea. And so we do all of our research. And Luke comes back to me and says, man, that episode's going to stink. Day this of guy recording. didn't do anything. Yeah, day of recording. He tells me, yeah, we're not going to do this one because it's going to stink. Um, he's probably not wrong about that. No. So we turned this into a one hit wonders inventor because much like all of the other folks we talked about, this is basically all he did. He did a few other things. But a super but impactful he, one. Very impactful. Yes. Um, let's see. Born in a small village in 1832. I thought this was interesting. His father was the village postman and he died the year that Otto was born. So that's sad. Otto did a great job in school. Mom wanted him to keep getting an education, but because of the German revolution and the declining economy, he had to quit and he became a traveling merchant. He worked at a, as a clerk in a grocery store, all this other good stuff. Event he got into sales. He sold like tea and sugar and kitchenware and all this other stuff. Um, eventually, he met up with some other folks while he was traveling uh, between small towns selling all of his goods. And he started talking to people about uh, the engine, which is interesting. So he learned about a new gas powered engine invented by, I can't pronounce this, E T I E N N E. That's not even a name. <laughs> Len Lenore. Um, it was the first workable, sorry if that's your name. name, please tell me how you pronounce it if it is. Uh, it's the first workable internal combustion engine, uh, blah, 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 time goes on. They kind of improved this thing, right? Um, they got a gold medal for a two-stroke engine at a big expo one time. And they're like, you know what? We can still do a better job on this. Um, they get some backing from some folks. I like what I had this. I had it. Teamwork makes the dream work. So it's all about the folks that he uh, combined with. So they went to the Paris exhibition. Like I said, they showed off this two stroke engine. They won for that because they had some connections uh, and, and it's a little shady, but that's fine. Uh, but eventually they came up with, or he came up with the four stroke engine, right? And in the four stroke engine of the auto cycle, which it's now called, the first outward stroke of the piston draws in a mixture of air and fuel into the piston through a valve in the cylinder. The second stroke compresses the mixture, preparing it to be ignited. Ignition of the fuel air mixture causes an explosion and the rapid expansion of the resulting gases then provides power for the third stroke. And on the fourth stroke inward, the piston forces the exhaust gases out of the cylinder through another valve. I believe we've done a couple episodes on engines that you should go check out uh, to learn more about how they work in more detail. Uh, but this design actually went against what was considered a good idea or prudent at the time. Uh, most engineers believed that every stroke had to be providing power um, kind of like the steam engine. That was mm -hmm. like the prevalent thing at the time. And Otto was like, well, that's stupid. That would be inefficient. And the way I'm working is actually better. But for greater importance to Otto was the concept of the 
stratified charge. And I was like, what the heck's that? Cause that's too fancy for me. It mm-hmm. refers to the working fluids and the fuel vapors entering the cylinder. So in stupid people terms that I understand, a stratified charge engine creates like a richer mixture of the fuel near the spark and a leaner mixture throughout the rest of the combustion chamber. So it's actually more efficient. Um, fun fact for you, the four stroke engine was an immediate, was an immediate success, but the stratified charge theory was disputed and discredited. Um, Otto was way ahead of his time for this one. So really smart dude, right? Way ahead of his time. Honda Motor Company would find a whole bunch of success with this in the 1970s. So it took a long time for people to get back to this kind of theory and make it work really effectively. The four-stroke engine became known as the auto engine, and the concept is called the auto cycle. So good for you, Mr. Guy. There's a bunch more stuff about lawyers and other stuff. Yeah, apparently, like, it was the two-stroke engine. They were loud, and, like, the, the like the cars were super, just because of the, the two-stroke engine was really, it was unbalanced yeah. and caused all kinds of problems. But I, if a four-stroke engine, I guess we should figure out the difference. We should do a thing on the difference between a four-stroke and a two-stroke engine. Because You don't like, know the difference? I, I I know two strokes, you got to add oil to the gas mixture. I I, I know that because- Did we not do an episode on two versus four I strokes? I don't think we did. If, if, if we did, uh, James, I don't remember what we talked about last week. That's if we true. did, I, I, I don't remember the differences because like, how would you compress the gas? In a, ah, well, we'll save that for another We'll time. save that for another episode. Fun fact for you, Luke. Shoot. Otto made it into the Automotive Hall of Fame in 1996, which nice. feels- really late in the game for me yeah granted i don't know when it started long. but you know you thought he'd get right in there but he got in in the same class if you're thinking of like the nfl hall of fame as our friends freelin and francis stanley of the stanley steamer if you nice. check out our episodes on inventions that killed their inventor you're gonna <laughs> find those boys right there that's all I have. Luke, anything else from your side? That's all I got. This was a fun one. I hope we can, I hope we do a version three of this because I, I think if we make it so that they may have done other things, but they're famous for just one thing, I think we can Gives probably a do bigger a lot group. of these. Yeah, I agree so. with that one. Hopefully you all enjoyed this and learned something about some of these amazing inventors. If you have any that we should be covering, if you want to say hi, anything like that, why don't you go ahead and email me at unprofessionalengineering at gmail.com. And until next time, see ya.